Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the 101st meeting of the Knowledge Management Community of DC. Today, we are very fortunate to have Professor Dave Snowden present Kneffin Weaving Sense Making into the Fabric of Our World. Professor Snowden is a pillar of the knowledge management community. He is a chief scientific officer of Cognitive Edge and the founder and director of the Center for Applied Complexity at the University of Wales. Please welcome Professor Snowden to our KMC DC. Thank you. professor if you want but not doctor so i don't mind it's mr or professor right okay, um, no problem and it's pronounced canevin right so it's welsh canevin and it's fairly easy when you realize welsh is phonetic the trouble is we have a different alphabet from the english which confuses people so the intention here is to talk for about 35 40 minutes open it up for questions I'd normally say throw stuff in the chat, but this is coming to you live from the Chelsea Flower Show due to circumstances I won't go into. So I'm, I'm outdoors in central London at the moment, so I can't see the chat um, and also see people. So um, it was interesting to be invited to do this. I think I started on knowledge management to about 30 years ago now. Um, my original work was in decision support systems, so this is the early days of computing. And I started to focus quite heavily on how do you better present information to senior decision makers. I did the corporate um, management information systems for people like Guinness PLC worldwide, so that was a sort of design type approach. Either way, that was an interesting period in my life. I then came on to become a general manager um running a business went on from there to a role as a strategy director within a company which was taken over by ibm and then ibm put me into one of those interesting roles they decided i was a creative which was nice of them so they basically paid me a salary to go and do whatever i wanted as long as it was interesting and gave them some form of measurable thought leadership and around about the same time, Larry Prusak joined in the States and kind of like we both ended up in the thing called the Institute for Knowledge Management, uh, which lasted for a fair amount of time. I then shifted on from that, moved more into strategy and complexity theory, and I'll talk about that in a minute or two. And really the general approach now, which um, I approach is called naturalizing sense making. So I'll define that, then I'll start to come back and talk about how it impacts on knowledge management. So sense-making is defined by me, and there are five distinct schools of sense-making, I can send you the links on that later, as how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it? And I also spell sense-making with a hyphen because I prefer verbs over nouns. So sense-making is the ability to make decisions, but critically, to know how much you can actually know, because you never know everything you need to know when you make a decision, but you need to be aware of the level of confidence because that actually impacts on the type of decision you make. And I'll say now that I famously said, I think 25, 30 years ago, knowledge management properly understood is about helping people make better decisions and creating the preconditions for innovation. And I haven't changed my view on that and I'm gonna keep focused on it. Um, so, that's the definition of sense making. Naturalizing comes from philosophy and it means to root what you're doing in the natural sciences, not in the social sciences. Now, that's actually a fairly novel approach. So, instead of actually taking the traditional case based approach, what we do instead is say, what do we know from cognitive neuroscience, from complexity theory, from material engagement theory, from the biological end of anthropology? What do we know about how people make decisions, about how people create communities, about how they interact with each other and the nature of systems? And if that's been proven in a natural science context, then we work with that, trying to work rather than trying to work against it. And that really contrasts with the case-based approach, which dominates most of the management literature. 
and you probably all know this quite well, is somebody goes out and studies 10, 15, 20 companies, they conduct a series of interviews. From that, they deduce a hypothesis, and they generally interview companies they deem to be successful, for example, and they identify things that those companies do in common, and from that, they create a recipe or a template or a focus or a way of working with knowledge or with strategy or with culture. It's a sort of common approach across all of them. The trouble is that, and there are several problems with this, one is the sample sizes are never big enough, and they tend to be the same companies recycled all the time. They tend to interview people who've got a vested interest in the particular fad at the time being successful. I've seen half a dozen books, all of which interview the chief knowledge officer. And I still remember we did some pioneering work in the big consultancy business when I was in IBM, in that we interviewed knowledge managers, and then we did field ethnography with the people in their employees. And there was no correspondence between what the employees said they did and what the knowledge management people said they did. There was a complete disconnect between the two. So that issue about who you interview and sample size is key. The other problem is they generally only take the positive cases, not the negative cases. Um, Lean Startup is a good case of this if you've ever read that book. So the guy interviews people who've been successful in Silicon Valley identifies things they've all done in common and then says if you do these things you too will be successful now when i was in the institute for knowledge management we conducted a similar process with dorothy leonard at harvard but we also interviewed all the people who failed as well as the people who succeeded and what we found is there was very little difference between what they did what you had is a huge market with many players so some were bound to succeed you know, just on statistical chance so again there are issues about that, but the real problem is the confusion of correlation with causation. So, for example, if any country in the world wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes it wins, all it actually has to do is increase dark chocolate consumption, because dark chocolate consumption per head of population directly correlates with Nobel Prizes per head of population for the last five or six decades. And that's a much bigger data set than you see in most management textbooks. Uh, the other one I love is that attempts at drowning by suicide or peaks in that directly correlate with the release of Nicolas Cage movies, but I can sort of see a reason for that one. So there are huge dangers in this. And if you think about where we are now in a post COVID world, actually nothing is going to be the same again anyway not just because of covid but because of the growth of populist politics because of the you know a war between nation states in europe that i never thought i would saw again in my lifetime um an energy cost crisis an impending global warming crisis which is going to start to impact anybody we need to be much better equipped to handle uncertainty than rely on somebody's limited study of what worked over the past few years or the past two or three decades so that's kind of like a different approach and i'll give you three examples which are relevant um, to this so the first is a famous set of experiments which have been run and replicated in many ways so if you give radiologists and these are highly trained people with a specific knowledge asset base you know they've got everything that they need um and you ask them to look for anomalies in a batch of x-rays. And on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, um, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. Then on average, 83% of radiologists will not see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. Uh, this is called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see, which starts to explain an awful lot of things if you think about it. And the reason for that is the most we scan of available data is probably about three to five percent. That then triggers a series of memories, both cognitive, physical and social. It's a sort of melange of, of all three. And the first pattern of those effectively merged, merged memories is called conceptual blending. So blending is a better phrase. The first stay pattern of those blended memories, which seems to apply, we, we, that's what we make the decision based on. So we do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. Now, if you think about the evolutionary history of humanity, you can see why this makes sense. If you think about the first hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. 
do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having identified lion, look up best practice case studies on how to avoid lions? By that time, the only manual of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I've found of a sort of documentary on how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a survivor. So we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privilege on our most recent experience. Now that means that the whole issue about how do we support knowledge workers is fundamentally shifted. So faced with conditions of uncertainty or novel uncertainty, you need to get multiple perspectives. You need people from different cultural backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, different gender backgrounds, all sorts of different backgrounds, looking at the same situation in parallel without collusion. And then you need to look at patterns in all of those responses. And that way you find outlier responses. We actually draw these like contour maps and they're called fitness landscapes in the literature. So we can end up with a series of colored blobs and some blobs are overlapping, some blobs are isolated. The isolated ones are the 17% who've seen something that everybody else is ignoring. And this is called a human sensor network. So it's using the whole of your workforce to create a real-time decision support environment where knowledge can be deployed in the context of a specific question or need rather than having to be codified in advance, something I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and one of the books I wrote last year, which is the European Union Field Guide um, to Managing in Complexity in a Crisis, this is one of the three big things you're actually meant to do, which is to set up your employees in a sensor network so you can do real-time situational assessment and real-time ideation of novel solutions. You don't rely on databases, you rely on multiple levels of human interaction. So that's kind of like one bit of science and one set of implications. The other one which is fascinating to me is that the human brain pays more attention to failure than it does to success. And if you think about it, all of you with children, um, you tell them bedtime stories. You don't tell them stories about how Dick and Jane stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, achieved the family KPIs and purpose statement because they'd laugh you out of court. Yeah? We actually tell them stories about, you know, leaving mummy and daddy without permission, meeting wolves and witches and warlocks and God knows what else. We make sure there's a happy ending, um, but the reality is the stories that we enjoy and the stories we tell our children are actually extended stories of failure, not stories of success. And the evolutionary reason for that is avoidance of failure is a more successful strategy than imitation of success. If you look in the workforce, the stories that spread most rapidly around the organization are not stories of best practice stories, they're stories of failure. Now we did a big project with one of the major aircraft manufacturers and the stories that people remember are not so-and-so clipped his um, harness, safety harness to the gantry and you know, performed the job satisfactorily with no accidents. They're about somebody who didn't do that, who fell off the gantry and luckily fell on another person who broke his leg, but they both lived. And everybody knows that story and it actually gives you better warning, better knowledge than anything else. We now build worst practice systems and we use fiction because fiction often contains far more truth than fact. So getting people to tell stories of failure, either actual failure or fictionalized failure based on turning point analysis to projects can give you much better learning and much better assimilation of that knowledge than best practice stories which tend to elicit uh, well my case is different type response so what i'm trying to do here is give you some base science and talk to the implications the other thing and the big area of my work is the use of complex adaptive systems theory um, please don't confuse this with systems thinking um, Complex adaptive system theory comes from physics, from biology, from chemistry. It's based on natural science, not social science. And it has a separate evolutionary pathway from systems thinking, although there are a couple of overlaps, but not that significant. Complexity deals with systems which are, the key phrase is they're deeply entangled. Everything is connected with everything else. 
and the sheer number of connections means that it's impossible to create a predictive model. And the same thing will only happen again the same way twice by accident, not by design. And the only thing I can say with absolute certainty about a complex adaptive system is that whatever you do will produce unintended consequences. And once you know that, you're sort of ethically responsible for them. So complexity deals with systems which are inherently uncertain. And the way you manage those systems, there are only three things you can actually manage. One are what are called boundary conditions or constraints. The other are experimental probes or interventions to see what happens as a result of the intervention. And you do those in parallel. And then the third thing is the energy amplification. If something starts to work, you give it more energy. If it doesn't work, you give it less energy. Now I'm gonna come back to complexity in a minute when I talk more about Kinevin, but those were three basic bits of science I wanted to give you. I mean, I could go into other things. So for example, material engagement theory, uh, and epigenetics established that we get biological change based on tools and culture within a single generation. And that's actually quite scary when you start to think through the implications, but that's probably for another day. So coming back to the sort of issue of complexity and knowledge management, uh, many, many years ago now, I created a whole set of principles or heuristics to better understand what we do on knowledge. So I want to go through the three main ones of those and think through the implications. And then I'll finish off with the Kinevin framework, which actually started in knowledge management and started in a major study in IBM on the balance between informal and formal communities. There are actually seven of these rules overall, but I want to focus on the, the three most important ones. So the first one is that knowledge is only ever volunteered. It can't be conscripted. Um, I can make somebody surrender information, but I will never know whether they have surrendered their knowledge or not. And I still remember back in my days in IBM, and I survived seven years there, seven months in the Jesuits and seven years in IBM, but I failed the test of obedience in both cases, and there's a story in that. Um, basically, I was doing some of the pioneering work on the use of narrative. So narrative is a key mechanism by which we store knowledge. It's a sort of halfway house between the deeply embodied knowledge um, of a highly skilled craftsman who's done a 20, 30 year apprentice who just knows what to do. And the highly, highly codified knowledge of, for example, a map user who knows how to read a map, but still has to go through a highly explicit process. Or if you want to put it in another way, narrative is a halfway house between tacit implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge. Uh, we tell stories and stories contain dense knowledge in terms of the way they transfer information. I say a large part of our work is using a product we developed called SenseMaker, which is designed in its Gemba version to capture continuous stories in the field under fire. In fact, we literally did that with the US Army and to allow access to those stories without the need for excessive codification. Either way, to come back to it, I was doing that initial work. We were getting quite excited by it. We were getting some major project projects. We were doing early work with pharmaceutical companies on understanding the way in which certain types of drug or agrochemical um, were used for suicide in ways that we could actually overcome that nightmare. And we were finding things in narrative research that we just didn't find through conventional interviews and anything else. Uh, particularly as we started to develop that into what's called distributed ethnography. And IBM got interested in it and told me I had to put all of my knowledge into the IBM knowledge management community of practice. And it's not that I didn't want to share what I knew, but I knew if I codified it and put it into that system, I couldn't codify it properly anyway. And um, that will be the second rule I'll come to in a minute. Um, if you come and ask me a question, I can answer the question, I can tell you what to do. But to codify all the possible answers to all of the possible questions, I'd have to write a series of books, and that's too much time. I also know in any large corporate, if you codify something, people will steal it without attribution, unless it doesn't work, at which point they'll attribute it to you fully. In fact, fear of abuse is a far more significant reason for knowledge retention um, then it's the whole traditional idea of power. By the way, that's a misunderstanding of Bacon's famous statement. 
So either way, I, I did what you always do in a large bureaucracy. So I said, okay, don't worry, I'll codify it, no problem, and then just didn't do anything. Uh, most problems went away in IBM, if you took that approach, but this time it didn't. So they linked it in with my bonus scheme for the year. And I then had a teenage daughter and bonus schemes and teenage daughters kind of like a closely correlated in terms of one creating a need for the other. Um, but I didn't want to share my knowledge. So I wrote a 16 page paper on post narrative, post, sorry, narrative understanding in post modernist thought. There's a fictionalized debate between Deleuze and Habermas. I think I wrote it after about six glasses of whiskey because it takes me three glasses of whiskey to open a book by Deleuze in the first place. Uh, most of the sentences had semicolons and most of the words had eight or nine, eight or nine, them, six, 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 not synonyms, um, you know what I mean, um, within them. Um, it was actually designed not to say, here's my knowledge, but to be signed to say, I know something about this, come and talk with me. Um, but I codified something in a disguised way and I got paid my bonus. And what you generally find is people either under codify or they codify in ways that lead you to them. That one of the things Larry Proustak famously said, it was one of his sayings I loved. If you have to spend a dollar on knowledge management, send one, one cent on technology and 99 cents on connecting people. And that's still true today. So you can't force people to surrender their knowledge, but they will do it in the context, which leads me on to kind of like a second rule on principle. This is an adaptation of Polanyi, um, who said, we always know more than we can say. I would extend that to say, and we can also say more than we can write down. So the process of taking something from my brain and my body, and consciousness is a mixture of two, into some sort of oral statement involves a degree of loss. And the more context I have before I speak to you, the less loss there is, or at least the more relevant the material is. And writing it down involves another level of loss. So if your knowledge management system is effectively focused on written information with search engines which rely on text analysis, you're dealing at best with about 10% of the knowledge of the company. And that leads us into this very distinct separation between managing tacit knowledge through networks, and I'll come on to that in a second, um, managing explicit knowledge in the more traditional focus on communities of practice, information systems, AI-based search engines and the like, and graph databases and all those sort of cool things. And then critically, this intermediary stage, storing people's stories. So for example, in our Gemba system now, we do lessons learning, not lessons learned. So as people are on the project, that anything, any lesson they learned, any idea they've got, any anomaly they spot, they either take a picture, record or voice, or write something down or any combination, and it goes directly into a narrative database, which is based on what's called high abstraction metadata. And I can go into that later if you want, but that's a big subject in its own right. This is the ethnographic approach. Now, that's actually quite important because if you wait until people have finished something and do a lessons learned review or a peer review, the way people remember things after the event is different from the way they remember at the time. So retrospective lessons learned are actually quite limited in what they achieve, regardless of the sophistication of the techniques you use. So what we do is we capture material in the field under fire. And I still remember I was um, in the Pentagon once, so just down the road from you guys, um, talking about their work on narrative. And I remember saying, you guys have got the best method I know for knowledge capture, in that you capture stories in the field under fire. They actually had knowledge management officers in the field working in combat. But you have the worst method I knew for knowledge synthesis, because you then take those stories and you write them up in doctrine in Trado. And I said, the loss on that is huge. Either way, it wasn't what anybody wanted to hear, so I more or less got told to leave the room, which in the Pentagon you tend to if you're told to leave. Then a few years later, General Sorensen, who was a three-star in charge of IT for the US Army, phoned me up, and he said, come in and talk, you were right. The only thing which worked in Iraq was platoon commander's blogging, which is a type of narrative. Nobody actually used doctrine, nobody used databases. And that led us into a live deployment with company commanders in Afghanistan in capturing material in the field continuously under fire in return for not writing patrol reports. 
And that Gemba approach, you know, the Japanese concept of Gemba is a really large part of what we now do. Because once you've got a body of narrative, you can start to determine what should be codified. If you don't start with that, and what can't be codified because it's based on experience or knowledge or social connections or whatever. So that's the second rule with some of the implications. I always know more than I can say, I always say more than I can write down. And then we come you know, onto this, this other key thing is that nobody, nobody ever refuses to share knowledge with you if you ask them a meaningful question. So if somebody comes along and says, can you help me with this? Most people will help but they can't codify the knowledge in the advance of that question. And this is all about the need to understand the high context specific specificity of any knowledge use. So, I mean, I, I'm now 68. I've got eight or nine people who work for me who I'm training up. I have still got a huge body of experience because I've worked in HR, I've worked in finance, I've worked in strategy, I've written code, I've been, a systems architect, I've done UX design and I've been in R&D. And so when I go in and talk with a HR director, I kind of like know where they're coming from. And I can focus my questions and what I propose to them based on that rich understanding of context. And I can actually do it quite quickly. And that ability to understand context is absolutely key because it reduces the cost yeah, of actual sharing. Yeah? So, Knowledge is only ever volunteered, it can't be conscripted. I always know more than I can say. I will always say more than I can write down. And in the context of real need, nobody will refuse to share knowledge, but they have to have the context, the questions to actually do that. And that leads back into what I started off on this when I said what we're now doing is building employee human sensor networks, which allow people to very rapidly deploy and connect material in real time. But that leads me on to the other key thing. And this comes back to the first major paper I ever wrote. It's the, uh, the second, the, the two early papers on Kinevin. One is on innovation. The second is called um, Complex Acts of Knowing. And it's currently, I think, the 10th most cited paper in the field of knowledge management. So I'm, it's not because it's a brilliant paper, because it was the first to actually say this and use complexity theory. And what I was doing was looking at IBM and I pretty soon worked out that actually informal networks are more important than formal networks in the way IBM work. Who you knew mattered more than what part of the structure you played. So we did an extended research project and we found that the ratio between formal and informal communities was about one to 64. So for every formal community, there were 64 informal communities. And those were the only, those were only the ones using technologies. At that time, it was team rooms from Lotus Notes. These days, it would be things like Slack. Um, those were only the ones using the technology on informal groups. And the great thing about informal networks is people in them trust each other. So, for example, I was in a very small one of those. It was around our work on narrative, coming back to that. Um, and that narrative in that group, we basically, we were early days, there were about six or seven of us, we shared all our failures. Uh, when we stopped being a maverick group and became official, one of the bad things is we were expected to close that group down and share it. So we spent a whole weekend removing anything which was something we didn't want other people to know and taking that offline. And then we handed over stuff we were prepared to share. Because again, that trust element was absolutely key. If you want to share failure, which is critical on knowledge management, if you want to measure the effectiveness of a company in terms of knowledge, sharing the degree of ease of sharing failure stories is actually more important than best practice. Yet basically that happens within trusted networks. And the reality is, and here I want to use a metaphor. Um, if you, you know, sat at Chelsea Flowers show here in a small, you know, stand of trees, those trees are my metaphor for the formal system. They're highly visible. They have clearly delineated root systems. In the soil beneath me, there are thousands and myriads of fungal strands connecting those tree roots. And they form a symbiotic relationship with the tree. Yeah? In return for certain nutrients, they feed the tree water and so on from the soil. So it's a highly interdependent system. It's a symbiotic system. And those fungal roots are my metaphor for an informal network or an informal system. 
And the reality is informal systems are what people fall back to. So in the course of writing the European Union field guides, you know, post in the middle of COVID, I think I interviewed over a hundred CEOs and also, um, you know, senior civil servants. All of them in a crisis had fallen back to their informal networks, not the formal system, because in the informal networks, they knew who they could trust. And then you get some very interesting differences. So for example, Singapore, and I've done a lot of work in Singapore over the years, everybody in Singapore in, the, in their civil service actually has done military service. So they've created networks in the officers' mess, the sergeants' mess, the annual two-week exercise, which cross across educational and class backgrounds. So their informal networks are really, are really diffuse and really effective. In my country, and I'm getting quite ashamed to be British at the moment, um, the informal networks at government level come from two or three elite schools and a couple of elite universities, and they're quite perverted because they don't cross silos. Now, the silo word is important here. People in knowledge management have been complaining about silos for years and saying, how do we break them down? And I think I first said this 25 years ago. I said, you can't break silos down because silos allow people to share knowledge at the right level of abstraction, so they're extremely effective. If I have to share my knowledge with everybody, regardless of their educational background, it's just too hard. What really matters is how I connect people across silos. So let me give you a couple of illustrations of the method that we developed on this. And this is called Entangled Trios. All of our methods, by the way, are on an open source um, wiki, kinevin.io. Um, so you can go there and look at that. Um, in Tangle Trios, I'll give you a couple of examples of how it works. It's basically focused on defining three roles from different areas of the organization and getting people in groups of three based on those roles to work together on short-term projects. And it's actually a very effective way of solving problems. Um, but it's also its main goal if you're doing, if you do that sort of exercise on about 40 or 50% of the workforce, at least twice a year, then within two years, everybody is within two phone calls of everybody else. And at that point, you've got a healthy ecosystem because you've focused on the way in which things flow, not what things are. And going back to that paper of mine, Complex Acts of Knowing, one of the main arguments of that is that knowledge is paradoxically both a thing and a flow, and managing the flow is more effective than managing the things. So let me give you two examples of that. Uh, one of the ways we now do um, use a requirements definition is not to send out an analyst um, who will only see what they expect to see. Remember, people don't see gorillas because they're not expecting to see them. What we do instead is we maybe create 15, 20 trios, and the trio roles are a systems architect, somebody with a picture of the entire system, a bright young coder, and a user trained to talk to IT people. Um, we put a lot of effort into this. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than train IT people to understand users. So if I throw 15 or 20 of those trios at a problem over, to, over a month, I get really rich analysis, multiple small prototypes, and people realize because they're in multiple small conversations, the things that technology can do that they wouldn't have known to ask for if they were in a traditional process. And again, this is using complexity theory and creating a high level of cognitive, cultural, experiential diversity in multiple parallel probes in order to identify what's possible within the system. Another example of one we do here, and this actually has a double purpose. This is one of the ways you capture knowledge from senior executives is when somebody joins the company for the first six months, they're required to keep a daily Gemba type journal at the start and end of each day of what they've learned and what they expect to learn. And that's actually a very valuable knowledge asset anyway, because it tells you the common stories, the things that everybody has to know. But then every week, they're given a senior member of staff to go and interview and capture that person's stories of their career. And the interesting thing is that really senior people will talk to junior people, but not to middle managers or consultants. It's kind of like a teaching genius. I famously called it the grandparent syndrome, in that grandparents will tell things to their grandchildren that they won't tell to their children and vice versa. 
And then we put those people into a trio with somebody, say, on a leadership development program for middle management. And we often focus those groups on innovation. So just for knowledge capture, but then as an innovation program. Now, we've just been doing one of these in one of the big pharmaceutical companies and literally taking people from three completely different disciplines, from oncology, from biopharm, um, from a clinical, and basically 50 or 60 trios of people from those areas looking at the future role of AI and the sort of things that we can do. Yeah, that's our second pro project on AI. We got another one which is using a technique called trioptical. Yeah. Now, what you can see I'm doing there is I'm not trying to codify. What I'm trying to do is to connect people in multiple novel ways so that novel patterns will emerge from those interactions. And then come back to that concept I said earlier of human sensor network. What we now do, for example, faced with a difficult situation, we present that situation to the whole of the workforce. They get 15 or 20 minutes to interpret it. And then we look at the patterns of interpretation to find common views, overlapping views, disputes, and also critically outlier views or people who are thinking differently. Uh, we use a similar technique in culture mapping where we present people with cartoons. We use gaping voids because they're brilliant. People choose the cartoon which represents the culture of their company. They tell a story about why they chose it. They interpret that. And again, we draw those maps. Now this leads me into a whole new approach to change. This is called vector theory of change. When we look at those maps, they basically say, we've got a body of stories, say, in an undesirable place, and a body of stories in a desirable place. So rather than saying we want everybody to be knowledge-centric and open and trustworthy, we say, is there any way we can create more stories like these and fewer stories like those? Now, that simple instruction can engage people in radically different ways. Um, to give another illustration, We've just completed a major project um, with one of the residential care homes in the Netherlands working for the Dutch government in partnership with the Leiden Institute, where we've had continuous narrative capture from residents, medical staff and relatives of those staff. And what's fascinating, this was originally meant to supplement the transaction systems, but actually now the transaction systems feed it because the narrative has more utility but we can look at differences in the way medical staff interpret that staff over the way, for example, patients do it. And we can actually do weak signal detection. We can use relative stories to give early indication of abuse in ways that we wouldn't manage with conventional scanning. But critically, if I go to a nurse or a doctor and say, how do you make patients more secure and safe? They'll get defensive. If I say we've got two years of patient stories here, how can you create more stories like these and fewer stories like that? We can engage people very quickly in highly pragmatic solutions. And that links in with actually a different type of KPI for a complex space in that you can't measure outcomes because you haven't got a predictive relationship between cause and effect. Everything is constantly churning. Everything is constantly changing. But what I can do is to measure vectors, and a vector measures speed and direction of travel for intensity of effort or energy consumption. So we don't get rid of KPIs, and this is a key principle behind complexity. It's a both and principle. We say the outcome based targets we've got are really useful, um, but they only work when the system is ordered and structured and constrained. Where it's complex, we have to take a different approach and measure vector or direction of travel. And I say that sort of narrative approach can be quite critical in knowledge management um, because it can also reveal um, novel patterns. In fact, one of the terms for what we do is called abductive research. And abduction is a great contribution of American pragmatist to philosophy. It's also known as the logic of hunches. So what are the most unexpected connections between apparently unconnected things? And that actually is key to innovation because innovation generally comes by noticing an abnormal side effect rather than a highly structured program. And coming back to the EU field guide, there are three things it kind of like mandates. And they're all about creating an ecosystem in your company which will allow real time readjustment. One is human sensor networks, real time decision support. The second is build large informal networks as quickly as you can, 
because that will allow knowledge to flow and people to be connected. And the third is map what you know at a very fine level of granularity so that what you know can be combined and recombined very quickly. Um, so to give a project example of that, uh, we were working on an innovation program for a lighting company. So, and they had this novel ideas, and it's appropriate given that I'm in a garden festival here, that people, that people used lights to light their garden. They didn't see lights as a garden feature. So we were looking at what can we do to innovate in order to get a novel reuse of our existing technologies. So we pulled in 3,000 stories in a week through a social media campaign about people's gardens, what they liked about their gardens, what they didn't. We didn't ask them about lights, but we hid things like, hid things like contrast and shade in the way that they interpreted those stories. That's the high abstraction metadata. And then we took all the core technologies in that company and people interpreted them into the same indexing structure that people had told stories about their garden. And then we mashed the database together and came up with five clusters, um, two or three of which became major businesses. Uh, the one I'm fairly ashamed of, um, which is selling really well, so I'm not ashamed of its commercial sex, but I'm ashamed of what it is, um, is a plastic rock that changes color based on temperature um, in pools in gardens, and it's really garish. But the core technology for that was something developed to handle urine-saturated staircases in a football ground. And nobody would have thought of repurposing that without that initial shift to a higher level of abstraction. So your last scientific fact, and then I'm going to open up for questions. If you don't know it, art comes before language in human evolution. So cave paintings are before coherent language, as also is music. Now we can see how it started as an accident, but its development into say the glories of Wagner or Michelangelo or whatever, that has to have some evolutionary utility. And as far as we can see, what high levels of abstraction do is they disconnect you from the material so you see connections that you didn't see before. And that's our general approach, yeah? into knowledge. We need to store knowledge at the right level of abstraction so it can be combined and recombined very quickly. And that's a new word for you called exaptation. Uh, I'll give you the biological examples. Um, a dinosaur's feathers, we know, we now know by the way, all dinosaurs had feathers and they were very colorful. It appears they evolved for warmth and sexual display. And then one small dinosaur started to evolve skin flaps under its forelimbs to better display the feathers like a peacock. And because they had to run very fast from predators, they started to glide and that's how we got flight. So a trait which evolved for one function under conditions of stress, exapted, it didn't adapt for something different. The cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved to ma manipulate muscles in fingers it then accepts in humans to actually control grammar in human language. So grammar is too sophisticated a change to happen in a linear way. It requires a non-linear radical repurposing or acceptive moment. And if you think that isn't relevant, then in 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine noticed the chocolate bar melting in his pocket, realized the significance, put a metal box around it, we got microwave ovens. Uh, the whole of the pharmaceutical industry is based on monitoring side effects, like a rather embarrassing side effect of a cardiac drug, which became Pfizer's Viagra, which is one of its best sellers. So I call this stuff small noticings. And one of the functions of knowledge management is to allow knowledge to be what I also call messily coherent, or also known as coherent heterogeneity. And the problem is, if we produce taxonomies, we produce structure, we depend on AI, we depend on text, we're reducing knowledge largely to its lowest common denominator, and we're reducing the opportunities for effective decision support and for innovation. So at that point, I will stop, and I'm open to questions. Okay, thank you so much on this. And if you have some questions, please go ahead and tap them in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and you know take great advantage of this opportunity to ask um, Professor Snowden um, some questions about uh, some of the work he's been doing in knowledge management. And 
one thing I'm trying to remember if I remember this correctly, because you kind of said this early on, was that um, silos were very important in knowledge management because of, they, they um, I forgot exactly what they do, but you mentioned that they were very important to have. Sorry, what was very important? Uh, silos or? Oh yeah, silos. So organizing people into functions. And if people haven't read Max Brasser's Knowledge Assets, they should. It's a classic of the knowledge management literature. So what basically Brasser says is that you have abstraction, codification, and diffusion. Mm -hmm. So something which is highly abstract and highly codified will diffuse very quickly. That's like a map, right? So lots of people can use it. Mm -hmm. Something which isn't codified and is not abstract. I mean, my favorite example of that is in London, we train taxi drivers, right? I mean, I know it's a novel concept for anybody in DC or New York, but we train taxi drivers <laughs> and it takes about two and a half years. They drive around the streets of London with a map of London on the handlebars of their, of their little motor scooter. And the exam is to be given any two points in London and they have to describe the route out and the route back from memory mentioning every major landmark. Mm. Nobody does it in less than two and a half years and it has a 40% pass rate over multiple attempts. And it's called the knowledge. And the reason it takes two and a half years is the hippocampus physically changes to accommodate that level of knowledge. Mm. Now, if you look at this as a balance, if you want to drive from Heathrow to London, a taxi driver will always beat a map user. And I always used to say, don't talk about tacit and explicit knowledge say, do we need a taxi driver or do we need a map user? Mm. If we need a map user, that's fine. We go be far like hell. If we need a taxi driver, we focus on narrative and training and apprentice models and experience. Okay, great, thank you. And Greg Duncan has a question. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, Greg, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank, thank you. Uh, hi there, Professor Snowden. Wonderful talk. I appreciate your time. My question has to do with uncertainty and leadership. And you mentioned the EU framework for crisis management. How does an organization deal with a novel crisis like COVID? I understand for healthcare and maybe some military organizations that have experienced training, preparing for things, that's, that they have plans in place to possibly leverage. But what about when it's a novel crisis for which an organization doesn't have any experience? How do they draw upon knowledge to know what to do? Thank you. That's actually what the handbook describes. So I can I can send the link later, but you can you can download the handbook for free or you can request a I wouldn't download it and print it off on PDF because it will cost you a fortune in ink. All right, but you a copy can be sent to you, you just have to pay for postage. So that's free from the European Union. Yeah. If you have the sense to still be a member of the European Union, even you don't pay for postage, but regrettably the English took us out. Right? So it actually describes what you should do. And it basically, we also have, um, if you're interested, we actually have a highly structured assessment process to go through what happened during COVID and say, what should we have done differently? Where should we go? And how do we build a system which is capable of responding to something like COVID in the future? So that's laid out in the handbook and there's a process. We've also actually just launched today, if you check my social media stream, you'll see the link, um, what's called a sacred storybook. So a standardized approach to capture everybody's stories of what happened during COVID, including the celebration of people who died, the different working practices, and to produce both artifacts from that, but also those models. So there's two or three things you can do there. Generally on leadership, um, the advice in the field guide, but which I've been given for years, and you learn this, I've been sea level most of my life, right? The more you get promoted, the more you only meet angrier and angrier customers and the fewer decisions you actually make, right? So generally the role of leadership is to coordinate but not decide. Unless there's a crisis, when you make decisions very quickly, not to solve the crisis, but to increase the option space for other people to explore and find solutions. So I say that is laid out in the handbook with a series of relatively simple steps. And as I say, we have got a full narrative-based assessment process now, which will allow you to both learn the lessons of COVID, but also identify things you need to do for the next time it happens. Because just to depress you all, COVID isn't the worst plague we're going to get in my lifetime, and I'm 68. There are things hatching out in the tundra in Siberia, bacteria that we haven't got any natural defense for. 
Thank you. Uh, one clarifying point, how does a heuristics um, tied to informal knowledge, knowledge exchange? Nah. No, that's a really good question. I mean, we do a lot of work, for example, in safety. Um, and what, I mean, th 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 let me give an example from the US Marines and Gary Klein's work, which I sort of followed on on. If the battlefield plan breaks down, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. Now, those are heuristics. So it basically says, if what we've planned for is happening and we know what to do, just do it. But if it doesn't, then we have to have something we fall back on. So capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving is a good idea. It's explicitly measurable when you, whether you do it or not. So for example, again, on safety, over multiple projects, we've actually found that the main cause of mental breakdown is often safety rules. Because safety rules kind of like assume a normal distribution of an average set of conditions over the past, but reality is normally in the tails of those distributions. It's a Pareto analysis. Go back to um, Taleb and others if you want to look at that. So what we actually have now is a rule about when the rules can be broken. And then we move into distributed decision making. So if you assemble a trio of people, that three is important with different roles and backgrounds, they're permitted to make a decision provided they document it and it's transparent and they can break any rule. And that's called distributed decision making rather than delegated decision making. And that's key to great response mechanism. But we don't allow it to be one person or one group of people. We force diversity into that process to reduce risk. So a mixture of network-based processes and highly codified heuristics, which you train people on, are two of the ways that you actually manage leadership in um, conditions of uncertainty. Thank you tremendously. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Dan uh, Barrett. He was asking, uh, who was the knowledge abstraction author scholar again, the one you mentioned? Okay, that's, that's my mentor, um, although he tragically died um, far too early a few years back. Uh, Max Boisseau, B-O-I-S-O-T. So he's, I mean, he and I, we have three unpublished articles because we kept getting excited and we never got around to finish them. So I've got to do them now instead, all right? But he wrote a book called Knowledge Assets, which actually won the strategy prize for that year. It's a far more important book than the Narcos book, which is fundamentally flawed. Right? I think there are two fundamentally awful models that kicked off knowledge management. One is the Saki model, which became BAR, is that focus people on codification. And the other terrible one is the DIKW pyramid. I, I, I get rid of both of those. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions anyone has? I'm looking at the chat. Uh, let's see. I, I've got one, Bill, real quick. Um, yeah, sure, go ahead, Dan. Uh, Dave, thanks for thanks for the author. I, I'm curious on the on the de siloing or or pro siloing side. Is there are there any other resources that you would suggest? Um, the the article I wrote, complex acts of knowledge, complex acts of knowing, which you can get on our website. That actually that's a an early Canadian framework before I really started to introduce complexity. So it talks about informal and formal systems and codified non codified. Right. So that's close. Um, so I would look at that, all right? Um, and it basically, and there's, there's also a chapter I wrote for Liberating Knowledge, which was the Confederation of British Industry Handbook on Knowledge Management. And if you drop me an email, I can send you that. That's, that's no longer available in print, but you can have that article. And that, that's where I argued very strongly that knowledge is the way we create information from data. So the function of knowledge management is to create shared knowledge understanding so that information is data. Now, if you look at this, if I'm an accountant, all right, so I was a financial director for a period, I can look at a balance sheet and tell you what it means in seconds because it's working at a high level of abstraction, but I have to share the knowledge asset to do that. Nobody wants to not be able to work. I mean, I can have great conversations with people in complexity theory. It takes like five minutes to have a deep conversation. If I had to do it with a broader audience, it would take three weeks and probably wouldn't get there. So silos are critical to allow specialists to work within these high abstraction, high codification environments. And trying to get rid of them is a mistake. In fact, I would increase them. But what you need to do is to radically increase the informal networks across those silos so that people can actually have conversations and then they carry their silo knowledge with them when they come into those conversations. So remember that thing I said earlier, knowledge is paradoxically a thing and a flow. 
actually creating the channels through which people, things can flow is far more important than managing knowledge as a thing, which always ends up as information management, which is fairly limited anyway. Great. So we're coming up to the top of the hour, so we have time for one more question. And it looks like Andrew here has his hand up. So you have a question, Andrew? Hey, Dave. Um, yeah, I have, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a choice because I have a couple of questions. Uh, one's about epistemic injustice. One is about Singapore's trash system. Uh, and one's about the structural characteristics of informal versus formal networks and kind yeah. of evaluating those. So do you have a preference between speaking uh, one of those three? I don't mind, you choose the one you most want answered. What was that? You choose the one you most want answered. Okay. I'm comfortable with all three. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like um, because we're in a knowledge management context, talking about epistemic injustice as a, as a feature of knowledge networks would be interesting. Yeah, um, that, that's a major feature of our work. Um, so when we capture narrative from people, um, we allow the people who contribute the narrative to say what it means to interpret it. Because power lies in interpretation, not in the original story. And we've done a lot of work here. There's a series of, if you haven't seen the webinars that I did with Tyson, the guy who wrote Sam Talk, who's an Australian indigenous person. And we talked a lot about that in that context. My colleague Beth, who was on those talks with me, she's also Welsh. She has a lovely way of explaining epistemic justice, injustice. She says, yeah, old men are philosophers, old wives tell tales. Mm -hmm. If you just look at that linguistic form, it tells you what goes on. So from my point of view, part of the problem with taxonomies and knowledge management is obsessed with taxonomies. And kind of like it rhymes with taxidermy and produces the same effect, all right? And I include black box AI taxonomies there is the structure we put on something is culturally determined and is generally epistemic and just. So what we do by moving to very high abstraction and allowing self-interpretation of originating narrative and mass participation in decision-making, it means minority views are visible without the minority having to present them so they can't be dismissed yeah, in terms of the way it works. And that's a huge area of work. Um, there's a book coming out shortly on Census Maker, which is delayed in publication because I haven't written the introduction. But there's a big chapter in that on epistemic injustice written by Beth and Anna, who worked for me. So that's worth looking at. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, sir. And uh, with that, we're going to have to close out because it's uh, one o'clock here. And I know you probably want to get back home. And uh, just thank everyone for showing up. You get a lot of, um, they love this talk. They just, this was a wonderful talk for us. And we really appreciate it. And Yes, please send us those references you mentioned. I will do. And you're probably going to have a lot of folks here wanting to buy your book once it gets out there. So kind of hurry up on that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Tara, I'm going to let you close out. Thanks a lot. Uh, Cheers. Just a lot of thanks, um, Professor Snowden, for this wonderful talk. I was taking notes, and I have a bunch of things that I want to research now. Um, so I really appreciate your your being willing to speak to us um, with this community has been around almost nine years and we're still going strong. So thank you so much for supporting us. A real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone, you have a good day and this will be recorded. So I need to shut off the recording, but yes, this will be up soon. Thank you for watching KMC DC's presentation. Hope to see you at the next monthly meeting.